feeling today, Waymaker Church? Yes. Yes. Uh, every time I hear that, I want to go low, low, low. Anybody? Anybody feeling that? Okay. Maybe that's just me. All right. I feel so exposed up here. Anyway, hey, today is a very special and significant weekend in our national calendar. Today is Memorial Day. This is the day where we remember the men and women who fought and died for the freedom that we get to experience even in this moment as we gather to worship God in a public high school. That is a powerful, powerful thing that we should never, ever, ever take for granted. And so we pause every year on this significant weekend and we remember those who lost their lives in battle. But we also comfort those men and women, those friends and family members of those people who have lost loved ones overseas uh, or in wartime. And so right now, I would like for us to honor the memory of those men and women, as well as reflect upon and pray for those who've lost loved ones in the line of fire, in battle, as we pause for a second for a moment of silence. Would you do that with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being who you are, for being our creator, our transformer, our redeemer. You are good, you are God. We understand, Father, that this life is finite, that this is a life before eternity, and that every one of us at some point will escape from this life, this mortal life, into eternity. But right now, Father, we thank you for the men and women that you put in place to give up their lives, to sacrifice, which is, Father, part of the story of the good news, that we would literally lay down our life for our brother, that men and women have done that for us, so that we can be here even speaking to you without the fear of being persecuted, without the fear of being pulled away from this moment. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray right now for the family members and the friends who've lost people in war, in battle. Lord, I pray for the family members who uh, right now grieve this weekend all over again. Lord, let this church minister to them. Let the people of your gospel, the people filled with your spirit rush into these moments and be aware of people they need to come alongside and comfort. Let us say the right things or not say anything, but be with them. And it is in Jesus' name that I pray this. Amen. All right. As you know, today we bring home this series, Playing with Disaster. Because here's what we realize. If we do not let God transform our hearts, we are playing with disaster if we don't let him come in and remove the sick, toxic, and dysfunctional things and replace them with the things of the spirit, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, and self-control, then we are going to blow up our lives and hurt a lot of people in between. And we say around here at Waymaker Church, nobody wakes up one day and just decides to blow up their life and make it a disaster. It is these decisions that we make to embrace these attitudes and these actions. We looked at pride and cynicism. We looked at, a, at this idea of spiritual exhaustion. And last week, we even looked at vice, the things that we feed that make our hearts not who God created and designed our hearts to be. Uh, today uh, is a very special day because we get to exercise one of the core values here at Waymaker Church, and that is our value of development. We are developing church. What does that mean? That means that we identify, we train, and we give wisdom, skill, and opportunity, and we hone those things for the new and the emerging generation of church leaders. And so strategically, each year we have Sundays where we allow people with the preaching and teaching gift to come up here and exercise, but also have that spiritual gift affirmed by this church. And today I get the privilege and you get the privilege 
to hear the teaching gift, but also the story and just the heart of Rachel Cantu, who is the resident over our Midway Middle School environment here at Waymaker Church. Yes. I loved hearing the truth that she brought to our church in the first service, and you are going to love it as well. God is going to do some new things in your heart and mind as he has done in so many people. Would you stand with me, though, right now for the reading of the scriptures. If you are new to Waymaker Church, each week we gather intentionally and we know that God does something with his gathered church and in us and through us differently than if we were by ourselves. And part of that is making the scriptures our anthem, our song, our prayer. And today we are in Psalm 103 verses one through five. Just follow along with my cadence and let this be our prayer today. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the, Lord, the good things he has done. For he forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. What a powerful promise and what a powerful prayer that we read today. That God is the one who heals our diseases. He is the one who forgives our sins. And that's worth celebrating. That's worth celebrating. You can celebrate that right now. Here's the thing. He doesn't stop there, though. He takes what he has healed in us and what he's forgiven in us and he puts us together with other people and he says, I want you to interact with one another and be a part of that healing and be a part of that redemption that I'm gonna do in there. And that is what we sing and that is what we pray today. What you are experiencing by just standing there besides someone who might even be a stranger to you, someone you didn't even walk in, is God is going to do something in our midst today that he would not do if we were apart from each other. And I can't wait to see that. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, take these words, wreck our hearts in the most beautiful, powerful way with them. Lord, I pray for Rachel right now that her words would be your words and that they would pierce our hearts, encourage us, guide us, convict us, coach us, and make us who you want us to be. It is in Jesus' name that I pray this. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Rachel can too, everybody. Oh my gosh, Waymaker Church, you're so good looking. Happy Sunday. Come on. I know your coffee is kicked in. A lot of you served in the first service. Can I get a good morning, Waymaker Church? All right. I hear you. The coffee's kicking in. The caffeine's kicking in. You look great. This is going to be an incredible Sunday. So as Pastor John said, my name is Rachel, and I have the incredible privilege of being a part of not only our Midway middle school environment, but also Way Youth. So I get to worship with people in 8th through 12th grade, and I get to say, hey, Way Youth, give me a woot. I paid for service more. It's fine. It's fine. But I get to worship with these people do you see these students in the front couple rows? All of them have spent time serving this morning. All of them are spending time praying for the people that are gonna encounter God's word. Like, can you believe that in a generation that they say, hey, no way, hey, you guys, just like go to school, whatever, you guys are spirit-led leaders, spurring our church on to something more. I know I'm not supposed to be talking to you, but I love you, I'm proud of you, and it's a privilege to serve with you. So, just a little pause before we get started. So Waymaker Church, I'm so excited. But the thing is we, some of us, we've never met before. So I wanted to get real, real with you and talk to you about the back room of my home. Hmm, wow. Okay, so I, my husband and I have hosted a community group for several years. And anyone who's ever hosted a community group or had people over at their home knows what I'm talking about when I say the 15 minute dash. It's that thing that you do that makes you look like a wild animal to make sure that no one knows that you live in the public areas of your home. 
Your kitchen will smell like there was never, ever any food in there. Your couch will look like it's never been sat on. I don't know why we fluff couches. I don't know why it's a thing that we do, but we do it, and our couches look very fluffy. And our bathrooms look like they were never a bathroom, and that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> and so we invite people into our homes, but what, we, what they don't see is what we have thrown into the back rooms of our houses. Maybe for you, it's your shed or a pantry or a closet. It is the actual back bedroom in my home. No one really goes back there. It's forbidden, like in Beauty and the Beast, it's the West Wing, no one. And so things like one time a bag of trash that could have gone outside over the top of my bed, laundry that is clean, dirty, and I don't know. I don't know what that is anymore. It is unidentified, like a straight up UFO in my basket. It's all behind the door. And what's funny about this is we all have areas like this, but what's even weirder is the lengths that we will go. Listen. I'm a nice person. I will tell you where the bathroom is in my house. But if you go past the first door on the right, I'm like, hey, that's not where you need to go. You don't need to, no, 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 you don't need to see what's back here. And I like, I transform and I'm like, no, you will not see that I sleep under a quilt. You will not know that I live here. And it's so odd, but for some of you, that is the the compartment between the driver's and passenger seat. If someone goes for gum in your truck, guys, they're gonna lose a hand because there's something living in there. And so we all have these physical places that we throw stuff, we don't know what's in there anymore, to hide. But I'm not up here talking for the next 30 minutes about the physical places that we hide our stuff in. We do this in our spiritual lives. We have places that we hide. It's usually the deep parts of our soul. When I'm talking about the deep parts of our soul, I mean our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions, maybe what we struggle with, maybe who we really are, maybe the things that we don't want people to see about our past. And so we have these places that we hide, and what we're calling it and what we wanna talk about today is specifically isolation. And the definition we're gonna use today for isolation is a decision to shut people out of the deep parts of your soul. This isn't accidental, this isn't maybe a lonely season, this is the decision that people will not see this, they will not know this about me, I'm shutting it away. Sometimes it's even the whole of you. The thing is, we've all done this, but it looks a little different for all of us. Some of us in this room, when I started talking about isolation and being on your own, you were like, that sounds fantastic. I accept isolation, have you met other people? They're crazy. And so you are someone who's a DIY guy, DIY gal. And so you're thinking, yes, I don't invite people into my life because they'll mess it up. They will bring chaos into it and I can do this. And so then there are some other people in this room that rationalize isolation. Some of you are moms of littles, you're full-time students, you're full-time workers at the same time. You're in a season of life where it's very easy to say, listen, the deep parts of my soul take a long time, and I don't have a long time. If I open that door, a two-year-old will run out. There is no, there's no time for deep parts of my soul, and you put it off until later, but we all know we create these habits, and later becomes never. And there's, there's a third group of us. We mistake isolation. Now, if you are mistaking isolation, you might just look around and be like, who, me? No, 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 not me. I'm surrounded by people. I have plans until three Tuesdays from now, and that's when I'm gonna take a nap. Just a power nap, five hour energy, and I'm back to people. These are sometimes our extroverted people, people who are surrounded by crowds, crowds of people that love them, but may not know a thing about them. In their effort to be around people and invite people into the fun, they've never invited people behind that door. No one knows what's behind there, and it makes being a part of the crowd, what once brought them energy, brings them pain. So we know that this looks different for all of us, but like how is embracing isolation playing with disaster? Like Pastor John said, these things, pride, vice, exhaustion, they will bring us to our knees. They will ruin our spiritual life. We didn't wake up one day and decide we were gonna blow, off our li blow up our lives, but isolation will take us there. Shutting the door to other people will do it. But how? 
what I want to do today is I want to dive into two different incredible pieces of scripture. But first, I want to preface the first one. This is Ecclesiastes 4. And so some of you are going to go ahead and start turning there in your app, your physical Bible, or you're going to look up on the screen. But what I want to tell you from a very honest place, because second service, I feel like you and I get each other, you know? Um, Ecclesiastes is weird. Ecclesiastes is a weird book of the Bible. I know maybe you don't think I should say that, but I did. What, the, why is it so weird? Why, because it's, a, it's wisdom literature. It's in the Old Testament, which some parts of the church are like, how do we deal with the Old Testament? How do we deal with wisdom literature? In addition, it was written by an old king who, honest to goodness, says it is meaningless at least 100 times. He is fed up with the world. He's fed up with life, and he's giving advice to his sons. What I want to tell the women in this room is there's not a lot of verses in Ecclesiastes you would get hand-lettered anywhere. You're not going to cross-stitch this on a pillow. It's not. But in studying this odd book that made me scratch my head, I saw so much about life and isolation from Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived giving advice to his son, his kind of last words, his memoir saying, this is what I've seen while I lived. Here's my advice. So we're going to be in Ephesians 4, 7 and 8 first. I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. Upper Solomon, thank you so much. This is the case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. Sound like anybody we know? But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. Whoa. This is like, this is a real story of people that we see and maybe we identify with. Who is this man that Solomon talks about? We know he's a hard worker. And I don't want to breeze past that because that is a noteworthy and praiseworthy trait. But where is that hard work getting him? He ends his part with, it is all meaningless and depressing. He's by himself working hard. And what is it getting him? Nothing. Embracing isolation leads us to exhaustion and a life without purpose. Even if we are putting our nose to the stone, where will it get us if we are alone, shutting people out of the deep parts of our soul? Now, the thing is, as we are figuring out this is bad, Ecclesiastes proves it, we're kind of looking inward and saying, I do this. I identified with the things that she said, but why do I do this? In looking at the scripture, in looking at my own life, and in looking at the lives of the people around me who open up to me and let me into the deep parts of their soul, I see there's two reasons that we do this. One, we embrace isolation because of pride. Now, if you guys were here a couple weeks ago when Pastor John talked about pride, he talked about the definition of pride that he used was, I know better and I am better, therefore, I don't need you. That's a rough, like, paraphrase in the Rachel version. But basically, pride says, do you know what people will bring into my life? I can do this on my own. I don't need them. I don't need their chaos. Your input is not necessary. And some of you are identifying with that, and you've been fighting that and you know it's what's keeping you isolated. For others of you, um, I wanna tread a little lightly on this one because it's pain that makes you embrace isolation over and over and over. See, there was a person in your life that misused and abused their access to the deep parts of your soul. Someone who laughed at your dreams. Someone who brought up your imperfections. Someone who said, you're not worth it. And you, kind of rallied from that pain and said, you know what? I am never going to get hurt like that again. So if isolation, if behind the door is where I need to be, that's where I'll live. And the thing is, pride and pain don't get us anywhere. Pride and pain and isolation don't get us anywhere we want to go. But when we see our motivation, we can start to see like really what's going on here. Because we want to point at other people. I want to say, you I know better than you, so that's why I isolate. Or you hurt me, so that's why I isolate. But this, we're just talking about the people symptoms. We are flesh and blood people. So sometimes we see people and how they interact with us, and we think they're the problem. But that's not the case, Waymaker Church. 
And if we keep whack a mole the people in our life and the situations in our life, we will always end up playing with and living in disaster. What this really is, is a problem between us and God. We say, God, I don't trust you to let people in my life that would guide me. And I don't trust you to keep me from pain because look what happened before. So we say, I'll stay isolated. We wanna make it about a people thing because people we can totally control and write off. But if it's a problem between us, our souls and God, we've gotta deal with this. So the thing is, I know Solomon said it was all meaningless, but let's go back to King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived and see what he has to say about a solution to isolation. Because right now, Waymaker Church, we can't stay here. In Ephesians, or excuse me, back to the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, this is what he says. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. I love this translation of the Bible. Not in trouble, not like kind of in the hot seat, in real trouble. And so what is Solomon saying? What, do, what answer does this give us? The answer is other people. Other people who can come after us when we're in these sick and toxic places. Other people who it later says in this passage can stand back to back with us, can lay with us when we're cold and alone. Other people, He's, Solomon's talking about connection. Connection's what we're gonna talk about today and we're gonna define it as a decision to open the door to the deep parts of our soul. And some of you are like, that's a nice definition. That's a nice door. But you know what happens when you open the door. All your pride, all your pain, all the stuff that you haven't even talked about, Rachel, because you don't know, will be exposed. And you know what? I can't refute that. You're right. Connection means exposure. But through the power of Jesus, Exposure means freedom and purpose. So the one thing is, this is the part of the sermon where we can tend to get checklisty. Uh, I don't know if you do that, but I do. And I say, well, they said connection, so I'll just go and I'll tell everybody what I do. Maybe a long post on social media will work. Maybe I'll just like get around a bunch of people. Maybe I'll hop on stage and just like, maybe they'll make a line after the mic and I'll just tell people what it is my introverted friends who would never hop up here. That is not what connection is. Connection is inviting safe and spirit-filled people into your life, into the deep parts of your soul to say, this is what's really going on. This is the reason why I don't like that thing, or this is the reason why I kind of avoid this type of situation. So the one thing is, connection is not spilling your guts on social media. Connection is not the people that overshare and leave you with their baggage. Connection is allowing someone to see what you've hidden for so long. Waymaker Church, if you, if you can hear me and that makes sense, just nod your head. You guys nod so well. You're so good at this. So the one thing is, I've mentioned that we can only do this with Jesus. We can't get listy about this. We need his power and his presence to make this possible. So I want to jump forward into the New Testament, into John 4. So some of you that were raised in the church, you have heard the story of the woman at the well. You flannel graphed it, you, you know all about it. So the thing is, what I want you to do is remember the fondness of hearing that story, but kind of like wash it from your mind. If we allow scripture to speak to us for the first time, like we're kids, we get to see who God is, we get to see who Jesus is and we get to meet him again. We get to see his fullness again for the first time. <coughs> Excuse me, the devil trying to keep me down. Not today. <laughs> Whew. Anyway, um, we can, second service, we can do that. Not with first service, but you and I, we're, we're good together. So John 4, let me set this up for you. So Jesus and his disciples, <coughs> thanks so much. People that bring water to church, give them a hand. Oh, we could talk about living water now, can't we? Amen, amen. <laughs> oh man, I feel so much better. Anyway, back to the scripture. So John 4, 
Jesus and his disciples, all Jewish men, by the way, are traveling in the desert. This is the Middle East, so it's very hot. What we need to know is they stop in a town in Samaria at noon. So we need to know that they're stopping there, and they've decided to rest there specifically. So jump with me to John 4, 7 through 9. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? So we've just kind of seen a little bit of conversation, and we're wondering why, like, if you think about it, the Samaritan woman was, like, really rude. I know she didn't know it was Jesus, but, like, that's Jesus. You need to be nice. And so we're wondering, like, why did you act like that? What are you doing? And so basically we need to give a little backstory about this woman. The Samaritan woman is what she's commonly referred to. So let's talk about Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans were descended from Israelites. So they're from the same people. They have some of the same religious practice. However, the Samaritans had decided that they would go against God's law and they would intermarry with other people groups and they would not worship in Jerusalem. So this left them ostracized. Jewish people were in full support of each other to spin on and ignore Samaritan people. Jewish people in the Middle East, where there was no Subarus at the time, would add extra days to their travel rather than to go through Samaria. Listen, I'd shorten a road trip any time, but their animosity and their hate towards each other was so great that they would say, not even. So it's even so cool in scripture to be like, Jesus, why are you even there? That's crazy. The fact that a Jewish man would talk to this Samaritan woman was nuts. But there's another level to this. Even though we know that women in ancient times were not equally regarded, this woman had some additional baggage. She was an outcast in her town of Samaritan outcasts. We logically can get this from this text because we know that she's at the well at noon. This is very odd. In ancient times, especially in this region of the world, it's so hot. It's so hot all day long. So women and men and anybody that needed water for their trade or their home would go get it in the morning. It was kind of a social thing and it would make it cooler so the labor was literally much easier. And so this woman, She's at the well, alone, at the hottest part of the day to draw her water. Why did she add all this extra labor? Because there were people in that water-getting morning group that she wanted to avoid. She was deliberately isolating herself in or by coming at noon, and we can see that. And I know that some of us know the story, but it kind of keeps us on our toes. Why? And what is Jesus going to have to say about it? So we go on to kind of hear about their conversation and Jesus being Jesus, amen. He, he's talking about living water, metaphor. And he's talking about living water, offering her salvation metaphorically. And she says to him, please, sir, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. What? This is the woman's worst nightmare. Not only is this seemingly socially very inappropriate, but this is what this woman has struggled to keep behind the door. She has said, okay, I'm going to structure my life, and I'm going to go to the well at noon, and no one's going to talk to me, and I don't care if it takes longer. I don't want people to know what I've done. I don't want to look people in the eye that in my town know I'm that woman. Isn't it hard when you know, when you talk in a group of people or you walk through a space that you're that person, that guy, that girl? We've all felt like that. For some of us, it's because of our sin. And for some of you, for me sometimes, it's stuff we can't even control. 
and we feel so ostracized and we do anything just not to feel different, not to feel kicked out by people's looks, maybe what they say. And so Jesus has really like, I know that we trust him and we love him, but I'm, I'm looking at the scripture saying, Jesus, why did you say that? Yeah. It's okay to say that. When we, when we question the scriptures and they come back, we learn about Jesus. When we're not afraid to ask God, tell me why, he will tell us why and show us how. I'm just going to leave you with that. That's free. But the thing is, this woman, her worst nightmare has come true and she has been exposed. But I, and I want us to sit in that because this is what we fear. But what we have to do when we look at the scripture is say, okay, what is Jesus going to do? Of all the things he could do, what is he going to do? And what he doesn't do is give her a long rabbinic lecture. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He was a Jewish leader. He knew the law. He knew what she had violated. And he didn't say any of it. He could have literally run away. Like, nope. I see you. I know what you've done. I left. We see in this passage, I want you to go back this week and read it and see. He continues a conversation with her, even with her avoiding him. She's avoiding. She goes to talk about religious law. He stays there. And later on in the conversation, Waymaker Church, lean in right now. Where Jesus doesn't give blame or shame or judgment, he reveals part of his identity to her. He's, when she says, we're waiting for the Messiah, Jesus said to her, I am the Messiah. The Samar Come on, you can clap for that. For some of you, that word has a lot of meaning. And for this woman, it had so much meaning. The thing is, the Samaritan people, the Jewish people, had been waiting for the Messiah, which meant the promised deliverer for hundreds of years. They had been in slavery. They had been separated. They were waiting for the promises of God to come true through this one person. And he says, it's me. And what we also have to make sure that we know is that no one else knew that he was the Messiah. This was the first person. This woman was the first person to hear, I am the Messiah, from him. Why? She, she, she did bad things. She wasn't worthy. We don't have to be worthy to need a rescue. That's why we need a rescue. It's so crazy. This, this part of the passage makes me crazy because of all the things Jesus could have done. He said to this woman, I am the Messiah. I am your promised deliverer. I am your rescue. Where we expected condemnation and shame. Look, this is what it is. This is everything. We expect you're wrong. Go away. Go back to your husband. Ugh. She heard I am the Messiah. I'm your rescue. And then I'm kind of on the edge of my seat as I'm reading this because I'm trying to go back to before Sunday school days. And I'm like, what is she going to do? What's she going to do? So let's go on to the next part of our passage. This is in um, John 4, 28. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Y'all, this is crazy. The woman who was fine sweating it out and being by herself to go to the well at noon ran, left, her, left what she came for, that water jar, and ran back into the townspeople she'd been avoiding. Hey, he told me everything I'd ever done. Could he be our rescue? The thing is, what flipped? What changed? The woman who had structured her whole life around no one will see me. No one will know. The woman who reminds us of ourselves, if we just let ourselves think about it for a minute. What changed? She had an encounter with Jesus where it was, where he said, I am your rescue. And it changed her life. She went from that woman to the first evangelist. She went from someone who had no worth to a history changer. She went from the person that the townspeople avoided 
and talked about as a bad example to someone who is written down in history as the first one to bring their town to Christ. This is a big deal because we are like that woman. Not worthy, too much in my past, you don't know, my hopes and dreams are too big, I'm not good enough. But when we encounter Jesus, when we see that he is our rescue, we are given freedom and we are given a purpose. Do you remember the man in Ecclesiastes? He worked so hard, this noteworthy thing, yet his life was exhausting and meaningless. And this woman, without the water she came for, ran into a new life of purpose and a new identity. This is Jesus. This is the God we serve. This is the one who says, I know that you hide. I know that you put yourself in big chunks of who you are, your identity, your hopes, your dreams behind this door. But it's not what I have for you. It's not good enough for the death that I died and the life that I purchased for you. It's not good enough. So the one thing is this leaves us with some choices. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. So if you do not know, I am expecting my first child, which is a good thing. It's a yay. It's a boy. I know he's going to be obsessed with dinosaurs. All the good things. Yay. So found out in um, late January that I was expecting. And in February, I started to feel pregnant. It's very normal. Um, but what the thing is, what was started as extreme fatigue and um, emotional highs and lows, which are normal, um, became a spiral. You know, I, yes, I needed to nap, but it started to be um, I could do less for my team and for my family and for the people around me because I was physically limited. Um, and that physical limitation left me feeling really broken, really incapable. And then the emotional highs and lows, I had no control. I cried eating waffles at the office one time. I, that's a funny example, but it broke me because I, was no, I didn't even feel like an adult anymore. I felt like a child. I felt so limited. And then I realized, and it sets in all the time, what a miracle this was. But I was struggling. And how dare I struggle when people want this miracle every day. And so my naps became my refuge. And I know that that sounds funny and it sounds cool and maybe ideal to hide away in the refuge of Netflix, but it wasn't funny when my boss stopped getting honest answers from me when he asked, how are you? It wasn't funny when my friends stopped getting texts back and I wouldn't talk to anyone. When invitations out of the house, I knew I wasn't good enough to keep them, so I didn't. It was a time where I chose isolation because I wasn't supposed to need anyone. And I was so hurt by what I couldn't do or the expectations that were placed on me by Pinterest, Instagram, the moms around me that I so admired and the ones who so clearly did not admire me. It was a hidden time. It was a sad time. And I thought, there's no purpose in this. You just like stay exhausted, and then you have a baby, and then you're exhausted again. And what's the meaning of all this? And I know Jesus, but is this it? But Jesus. There was a staff function where we all worshiped together, and we sang um, New Wine, the song by Hillsong. And um, during the song, the evangelical remix, where you sing it actually twice, very long, um, y'all know. God spoke to me and said, what if I could do, what if I could make something new out of you, even though you can't offer me your capability like I ever wanted it before? What if I could do something in your family to make you a history changer, not out of your own do it, not out of your own, I'm gonna help everybody move. I'm that personality type that's the helper. What if I did something in you that you couldn't explain, that you couldn't be capable of, that, that you could do even with limits to show me glory? He was my Messiah in that moment. He was my promised deliverer. He was my rescue in that moment. But it didn't stop there. 
after I made that connection, God exposed what I had been hiding for so long, I um, continued to step out. I approached my boss and I said, I'm so sorry that I lied. And I told you I was fine. I'm not fine. I hate this. I'm so sorry. And I was forgiven. And safe, spirit-filled people continued to walk in my path. People that I had avoided because I didn't want them to see me and I didn't want anyone to know became this refuge. Y'all, let me be clear. I needed to meet Jesus first. But his people, filled with his spirit, were like living water. Were like nothing I could even explain, even though I have a mic in front of my face. And slowly but surely, listen, I got sicker. I got bigger. Nothing, like, I was waiting for the circumstances or people around me to change. But what changed was me after I encountered Jesus and he put people around me that would walk with me and see the deep parts of my soul, see the deep parts of me, the identity that I wasn't sure would ever be intact again and said, you know what? I love you. This is hard. Through the power of God's spirit, he's gonna do something. And if you submit to this, if you are obedient, if you don't hide, you and your family can be history changers instead of people that hide, instead of people that go to the well at noon, instead of people that are always trying to look perfect. I know we say this in church a lot, but we've really got to kick that bucket. It's not about that anymore. And I feel free. My body feels worse, but I feel better. What is that? Who is that? That's the Messiah. So what do we do? What do you do? When we start talking about isolation, some of you really wanted to get a call for a diaper change. You really wanted to get a phone call. Oh my gosh, I have to leave. But now, through the power of God's spirit, and the fact that this mic stayed strong the whole time, you've heard that embracing isolation will lead you to exhaustion and will lead you to bondage. But connection and exposure will bring you freedom and a purpose better than what you could ever manufacture and push out from that door. So what do you do? What do we do? Number one, is you guys are gonna ask yourself this question. I want you to look yourself square in your eye. I, you do that in your mental mirror. Really look at yourself and ask yourself the question, who am I opening the door to? Who have you talked to recently about more than the weather or that game? Who have you talked to about what's really going on, what you're really struggling with? Some of you keep talking, keep telling them, the thing, you're, you're growing so much in this. I know that there are people in here that, you, that God has already pushed you to start doing this. Keep going. Tell them the thing that you wanted to hold back, but you know today in your heart through the power of God's spirit is gonna bring you freedom and give you purpose more than live, die, go to be with Jesus. Live, die, go be with Jesus. Sing some songs in between. Some of you, you need to get out of your seat today. I'm gonna to say the word move, and I'm gonna say move again. You need to move. And during our response time, you need to come up front or go to the back and talk to someone with a care team lanyard. These are safe and spirit-filled people who have been affirmed by our church. And they don't wanna open the door and say, well, you have got to get rid of that. They wanna say, wow, the Holy Spirit brought you up here and you have been obedient, let's go. He was my Messiah too, he rescued me too. Some of you, I know in this moment, some of you have wanted to walk up to a care team member for weeks and it seemed too hard and it seems like you're gonna be exposed and they're gonna judge you. That's not the rescuer that we know and that's not who he has called us to be, Waymaker Church. So as you ask yourself that question, move. If fear threatens to keep you in your seat, tell fear who your Messiah is. Tell fear who your promised deliverer is. 
and that he is here in this room, bigger and better than that fear that would keep you in your seat. Number two, some of you need to structure your life for connection. That sounds real, like, schooly, but I have seen some of your planners, and I have seen the way that some of you book up your day. Maybe sometimes the way that you leave church. You have a connection with Jesus. You believe and follow Jesus, but you need to allow time, space, and opportunity for someone to see the deep parts of your soul. Stop going to the well at noon. That's not who you are anymore. Enough. You are new. You are a new creation. You, this is first evangelist life. This is not that girl life, to keep with the metaphor. Some of you, this means coming down front. Some of you, this is gonna specifically mean joining a community group or joining a connect group. And I know there's been a hesitation in you for weeks to join a community group or a connect group. You've said, no way. I can do this on my own. I can't, I can't think about the pain anymore. I, I, I just can't go there. Community groups and connect groups are not there to dig out your pride and pain. They're help, it's gonna help you build a network for the second time or maybe for the first time of safe, spirit-filled people who will open the door to you as well. There's a system to help you do it so it's not jarring. Is it gonna be hard? 100%. Are you gonna meet people that maybe put stuff in their back room? 100%. But let people get around you and know who you are and know what you struggle with because there is freedom and there is rest. Aren't you tired of hiding? For some of you, you are in a community group and you show up and you bring your snack and you sit with your spouse and I'm so glad that you go. Do not waste a weeknight of your week going to community group and standing behind a door. This is not a participation trophy. This is not gonna get you anywhere. Go to community group this week and open the door. Say what's really going on. I know you maybe have never done it before. Practice with a care team member. Tell your spouse, I'm gonna tell them what's happening at work. I'm gonna tell them that I like them. I'm gonna tell them that I dream of one day doing this. The thing is, I know that community can be transformational, but showing up with your snack isn't the part that's gonna change your life. So, Waymaker Church, it's time to move. I want you to go ahead and stand up with me, and we are about to worship. We're gonna sing about the name of Jesus and what it has the power to do. So in this moment, do not sing a pretty song. In this moment, respond to the Messiah who rescued you. Respond to the Messiah who's still waiting and saying, I'll come back next week and I'll pursue you all week and I'm, I won't let you hide and I see you and I still love you. In this moment, don't let fear keep you in your seat. In this moment, move. We have a Messiah who is worthy of our obedience. Let's respond. <laughs>